Woman, hear what I say. You better listen to me. Cause I got two names in the hole. And one up my sleeve. So if you want to get a closer look at David Garibaldi's playing on If I Play My Cards Right by Tower of Power, stay tuned. Welcome. On this video, we're going to take a look at the great David Garibaldi, arguably one of the most influential drummers we've had on the scene over the last 50 years. But before I get into it, make sure to hit the red subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you're aware of every time I upload a new video. He was born in Oakland, California in 1946 and he took a keen interest in music early in his life as his mother and sister were singers. He gravitated towards percussion more or less uh, around age 10, so still quite young. It wasn't until he was in high school where he heard an older drummer playing the drum set, and that's when he focused attention primarily on the drums. After high school, he attended a place called Shabu Junior College in Hayward, California, and an interesting thing happened to him there. He had the fortune of seeing the James Brown group in town, and uh, more than that, he had a chance to check out their rehearsal earlier on in the day and he was highly influenced by the accuracy, the rhythmic accuracy of the band's playing. Kind of foreshadowing his own playing, wouldn't you say? <laughs> he interrupted Shabu to uh, college, that is, to join the military. He joined the Air Force, uh, and in the Air Force, he played mostly classical percussion, timpani, snare drum, uh, mallets, and the like only playing drums on the side with friends. 
Uh, he finished Shabu, he came back after the Air Force, finished Shabu, and then became uh, a freelance musician in the Bay Area where he ran into the Tower of Power led by Emilio Castillo. Um, and I guess you could say the rest was history, right? <laughs> uh, it says that David Garibaldi considers um, the Tower of Power his first musical love. <laughs> you know, I can understand that. He played with the band from 1970 on and off to 1980, and it took a very, very long hiatus for 18 years, as a matter of fact, and started back up with them to the present, um, uh, around 2000. David Garibaldi has played with a lot of other musicians like Jermaine Jackson, Boss Gags, the Yellow Jackets, um, Denise Williams, so, you know, and many more. He also is a phenomenal clinician and has a lot of teaching material, uh, books, videos, and he explains what he does very, very articulately. So it's really well thought out and easy to follow. His drumming concept was influenced by the drummers of James Brown, like Javel Starks, Clyde Stubblefield, Melvin Parker, uh, the Meters, Zigaboo Modalist, Bernard Purdy, Greg Errico from Sly and the Family Stone, Mike Clark, and a lesser known drummer by the name of Pete DePoe. Now, Pete DePoe is significant in that he influenced Garibaldi's hi hat approach rhythmically. It's something that uh, the band that Pete DePoe played a lot of, and the band was called Redbone, a really interesting Native American band from Los Angeles. Pete DePoe's playing is really fiery, and this right-hand approach rhythmically is fascinating. I can see why David Garibaldi was uh, interested in it. I will be talking about that in uh, some added footage to this video that I will be putting on my Patreon page. So check that out when you have a chance, and a song called uh, Vuelo por Noche, uh, Vuela por Noche, and that's on the same record that the song I'm dealing with today is on, uh, Tower Power record, and it, uh, that groove really comes together uh, in that song. Uh, Pete DePoe's groove was dubbed the King Kong beat, because there was a song that had lyric with the name King Kong in it, so <laughs> this groove really kind of stuck in Garibaldi's head, and he is one of the things that helped him develop his overall concept. So you would say his concept, he's a master of the 16th note funk, and the concept they use is, uh, it's a layered feel, as far as the instruments use the way he layers the rhythms. It's also linear, with that King Kong hi-hat or ride cymbal pattern on top of it, all happening at once. So, um, the song that we're dealing with today, of course, is called If I Play My Cards Right, found on the record Drop It In The Slot from 1975, the Tower of Power group. And the rhythm section is Bruce Conti on guitar, um, the great Rocco Prestia, who sadly has passed away, Chester Thompson on organ, and David Garibaldi. The uh, horn section, the Tower of Power horn section at that time, 1975, for that record was uh, Emilio Castillo, Steve Doc Kupka on Barry, Lanny Pickett also on tenor, Greg Adams on trumpet, and Mick Gillette on trumpet. Now, each of those musicians played several doubles, meaning like flute and other brass and other reed instruments. Fantastic band, very cool song. I will be breaking down six of the grooves that David Garibaldi plays in, on, the, uh, on the track and sort of trying to pull apart exactly uh, one way of interpreting how to play them. Play them slower so you can check it out. So please make sure to download the PDF so that you can follow along. Also, I give you a full transcription of the track. So you can see how he through composes the way he plays his parts in this music. It's quite fascinating. All right, so let's get to it. David Garibaldi is a master of uh, a kind of 60th note playing, whereby there's uh, dynamics that occur inside of the groove. They're consistent. This is not a new concept. Uh, drummers have been doing this 
decades before that. But um, in 60th note playing and funk, he sort of made it more crisp in a lot of ways. Okay, so uh, if you check out his book, Future Sounds, he has a little chart uh, at near the front of the book, I think on page seven, that essentially articulates this. Uh, the bass drum is played strong, so you feel it in your chest, but it also has like a mezzo forte, not just forte or or 2S. And the mezzo forte is usually a pickup going into a downbeat. The snare drum, uh, the accent is extremely strong. And uh, the distance between the accent and the ghost note is extreme. The ghost note is usually like piano down there. The same thing for the hi hat piano for the the tip of the stick and the shank of the stick plays the accent. So you could find yourself playing a groove something like this. That kind of vibe. So the first groove of if I play my cards right goes like this. Okay, really cool feel that locks in with the band in an incredible way. Now, I found something out by reading an interview while I was researching for this t video, and uh, it turns out that often on many of the more intricate songs, the drum part came first before the rest of the music. Aha! <laughs> Because all these years I've wondered, you know, I couldn't imagine walking into a session, someone putting a chart up, and then laying down these incredible grooves, like, on the spot. I, I thought, well, maybe they rehearsed them, but I always thought that the song came first. And uh, it was terrifying to think otherwise, <laughs> to say the least. But it turns out that, uh, you know, Garibaldi would create these songs in such a way, like he would compose these parts. Right, because they are very well thought out. In fact, you would compose the part for the whole song. And if you download the transcription for this, you'll see how completely through composed this playing actually is. You know, the B section's a certain way, the bridge is a certain way, the way that he uh, transitions from the verse into the chorus is a certain way. It's really very clever. So that being said, the fact that the drums come first it makes sense that they would lock in to different parts of the groove so intricately and so beautifully. Now, the other thing, uh, well, first I'll play that groove slow. Three E and a four E and a one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a two E and a three E and a three E and a four E and a three E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a four E and a two E and Okay, so uh, in his book, um, The Funky Beat, which accompanies a video that he made, Dave Garibaldi writes out uh, a part for this song that is similar to what I just played, but not exactly the same, to the point where I thought I'd made an error in my transcriptions. And no, what I played along with the track clearly fits. But this is the groove that um, he wrote out. One, two, three. Now that is uh, similar, but not the same. But I can understand uh, how it relates to what he ended up playing with the band. I could imagine that was the original idea, and that's probably what he practiced and worked on. But then when it came to playing with the band, 
he interpreted it differently for the recording in that it really locks in what the band's playing in terms of long and short notes much better what's on the recording compared to that last groove. Here's that last groove slow. Three E and a four E and a one and a two E and a three E and a four E and a two E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a three E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a four E and a two E and a three E and a four E. Okay, so that's the feel for the main groove. Now, in the um, verses, uh, this is a time when drummers really came down for the verse. Unlike today's pop, where, you know, there's sort of a static feel that goes through a lot of the songs, uh, dynamics are less obvious uh, in current pop music. A lot of that's because our ears are so trained to the sound of the machine and samples that uh, that doesn't occur as much, if ever. <laughs> Um, dynamics are more a thing of texture. The less stuff makes the music come down compared to musicians physically playing quieter. So uh, in this, though, there are dynamics and things are thinner, yet uh, what David Garibaldi does is he'll um, take notes out of the groove or put notes in in certain places or accent different parts of the groove to clear way for the vocals to come through. So here's the... Uh, the second groove, which is the first verse groove. One, two, three. Right, so he's taken the, one of the kicks out, and the uh, anticipation, the last 16th note, is... Uh, really locks in with the horns, and it's not accented as hard with the, the hi-hat. Slower. Three, E, and a, four, E, and a, one, E, and a, two, E, and a, three, E, and a, four, E, and a, two, E, and a, three, E, and a, three, E, and a, four, E, and a, three, E, and a, two, E, and a, three, E, and a, four, E, and a, four, E, and a, two, E, and a, three. All right, so now the, um, that would be like verse A. Uh, then uh, the third groove is like verse B and verse C. They're very similar. So verse B, he starts to play lightly with the hi-hat, and it just, the vibe is a little more playful. lighter, much more playful. The, the 16th note feel between the hi-hat and snare drum, you know, it's very syncopated and it, um, it kind of, to me, it kind of rattles along in a sense like there was percussion, like there's someone with a shaker or something. That's the sense I get with that. And uh, I'll do it slow. Three E and a four E and a one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a two E. Great. Now, um, I would call this 3B, the, um, the second approach, or verse C, the third verse, the second approach to this very same groove. Um, is interesting in that he leaves out beat four, the backbeat of beat four, that stays a ghost note, and uh, accents the last sixteenth of four, anticipating one in the next bar. So you have the backbeat on two, and, and the rhythm stays the same, excluding the accent on four, and only accenting the last sixteenth of four. And with the horn parts, it really sounds great. So here's what it sounds like. One, two, three, ah. Uh.
So like the horns pick off that uh, that last sixteenth on four. To, to, I don't know. It's one of those things that just gets me. <laughs> Here it is slow. Three e and a four e and a one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a two e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a three e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a four e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a. All right. Now on to the fourth groove. Now the fourth groove is what uh, he plays in um, all of the, the choruses, or the pre-chorus, I should say. It leads up to the chorus. And it's a, a typical upbeat ride cymbal pattern that you hear a lot of drummers play in the 70s. I mean, people still play it now. It's just not as common. But at that time, it was sort of like the hip new thing. But uh, the way Garibaldi plays it, um, you know, it just, uh, to me, just feels extra funky. So here's the groove for the pre-chorus. One, two, three. Now that, um, you know, typical groove, and then that goes into the, into the chorus. So here's your, here it is slow. Three E and a four E and a one E and a three E and a three E and a four E and a two E and a three E and a three E and a four E and. <laughs> okay. Now the fifth groove is really interesting, in that it's used in the bridge, and it's interesting in the way that the feel of it is displaced. You know, the way it syncs up with the horns. Um, and I could see how this was definitely composed on the drums before the horn section uh, laid their part on for the bridge. So this is what it sounds like up to speed. One, two, three, ah. Uh. So it feels like the last note being the upbeat of four is four, but it isn't. It's the and of four. I don't know, it just seems that way, I guess, because the whole, it's like the whole thing, rhythm is shifted over by uh, an eighth note. It's, it's very cool to me. And another unique fa uh, point is that they use a kind of shuffle or um, uh, swung sixteenths. You know, it, it suddenly the whole feel of it starts to swing. So that's the only place in the whole chart that it actually does that. I sort of look at it as being put on the 16th note grid. Sorry, the 60th note triplet grid. Very big difference. 60th note triplet grid. So that would sound like this when you play it slower. Three triplet and triplet, four triplet and triplet, one triplet and triplet, three triplet and triplet, three triplet and triplet, four triplet and triplet, two triplet and triplet, three triplet and triplet, three triplet and triplet, four triplet and triplet. Like that. <laughs> you know, so uh, it feels very strange. And when I was tracking, I made a point of trying to really count through that section. And uh, I got to tell you, it's kind of entertaining. <laughs> Man, my whole little party in here. But you know, try to count through that. Uh, if you go ahead and learn this this chart, uh, when you play along with the band, it really feels strange, but it sounds so good. Okay, and uh, the sixth groove that we're dealing with is sort of an embellishment of the main groove. And uh, the reason why I wanted to point it out is that it's not much different, except for instead of opening the hi hat on the um, you know the second sixteenth of one, he plays uh, two sixteenth notes in that same space, and also has a ghost note going to two, all right? So it, uh, it kind of rolls along really nice and smoothly. The other thing that's interesting is that he takes that same groove and puts it up on the ride cymbal. This, is, this happens primarily during the outro, you know, when they start to kind of vamp out, and uh, the band is just really smoking at that part, all right? So uh, this is what it sounds like, up to speed. I'll play on the hi-hat first. One, two, three. 
Lower three, e and a four, e and a one, e and a two, e and a three, e and a four, e and a two, e and a two, e and a three, e and a four, e and a three, e and a two, e and a three, e and a four, e and a four, e and a two, e and a three, e and a four, e and a. Okay, and this is what it sounds like up on the ride symbol. I'll add the hi hat. Okay, so that six screws that you'll find on If I Play My Cards Right by David Garibaldi with Tower of Power. All right. Uh, the first few bars of that song, the intro, are also incredibly interesting on drums, and I do a breakdown of that on my Patreon page. So make sure to go over there and check it out. That will be included in the extra footage that goes along with this video lesson. And, well, if you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it. Go to AubreyDrumLessons.com for more drumming info and to book Zoom lessons with me. I've been doing lots of Zoom lessons and enjoying every second of it. Uh, you can also get me on Instagram. Okay, so I had fun with this. I hope you did, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching my video. Really glad you did that. Subscribe and click here if you want more performance and lesson videos.